to Insights webinar from Harvard Business Review Arabia and MIT Technology Review Arabia. This is Hamoud Al Mahmoud, the, the editor in chief of Harvard Business Review Arabia. Our guest today is a thought leader and a renowned investor and venture capitalist and philanthropist. He has many aspects that uh, make listening to him a very significant. Badr Jafar is the CEO of Crescent Enterprises and uh, president of Crescent uh, Petroleum. He also serves as a chairman of uh, Gulf Tainer, the largest privately owned container uh, port operator in the world. Uh, he is also the chairman of Pearl uh, Petroleum a partnership between Crescent Petroleum, Danagas, OMV of Australia, OML, uh, MOL of uh, Hungary, and uh, Rewest of uh, Germany. In 2010, uh, Better founded the Pearl Initiative, a nonprofit organization committed to promoting a corporate culture transfer transparency and accountability across uh, the Gulf region of the Middle East. This was in cooperation with the United Nations Office for Partnership. He is uh, a member of the United Nations uh, Secretary General's High Level Panel on Humanitarian Financing. He is also a member of the UNESCO uh, International Commission uh, on the Futures of Education and a member of uh, Board Overseers uh, of the International Rescue Committee. Uh, we uh, we would also like to thank Badr Jafar for what we expected uh, to be, uh, what we expect to be a rich discussion on uh, a diverse range of subject uh, matters uh, under the theme sustainability in unsustainable times. Uh, we were inspired and guided by our community uh, to touch upon a wide range of topics and discussion with Badr in order to do uh, justice uh, to them all, or at least most of them. Badr has kindly agreed to have uh, this discussion over uh, a two-part series. Uh, we will cover uh, some of uh, key matters today and hold another session in a couple of weeks time to cover the rest. Each session will be about 40 minutes, allowing some time for audience Q&A during the webinar. So welcome Badr and thank you for uh, being with us today. Great to be with you, Islam. Thank you. Better my role uh, is uh, supposed to be uh, today uh, to open the session, uh, welcome you and welcome our audience on Zoom, plus our audience uh, who are watching us uh, live uh, on LinkedIn. But uh, uh, before I uh, leave it to my colleague uh, Karim Tapa, uh, who's going to moderate this session, allow me to ask a question that uh, has another, um, has uh, nothing to do with uh, the theme of today's webinar. But as a journalist, I feel it's my obligation to seize this opportunity uh, as I am in front of a thought leader, Emirati businessman, to ask you about the announced uh, UAE-Israeli peace agreement, officially uh, Abrahamic Accord. This topic, as you know, is uh, on everyone's mind, but not necessarily everyone's uh, lips. So can we uh, get your uh, perspective on this as an Emirati businessman, better? Wow, so I didn't realize uh, I'd signed up to hard talk. Yeah. <laughs> First and foremost, assalamu alaikum to Jamia. Uh, it's an honor to be with you all. Uh, and of course, a big thank you to HBR uh, Arabia, even despite the uh, soft first question. Uh, my perspectives. So first, I guess a disclaimer. I have deep Palestinian heritage from my mother's side of the family who are from Nazareth and Nasra. Uh, my maternal grandfather, Sheikh Badr al-Fahoum, was uh, Qa'im Maqam, Nasra, or, or governor. Uh, and, the, and, when, and the family was displaced during the Nakba, of course, in 1948. Uh, and the Palestinian-Israeli issue is obviously a hugely emotive one for so many people, especially for the generation who suffered the most uh, and who still bear the scars. I'll say though that sometimes when any unsolved problem festers for a long time, you see a phenomenon where people fall in love with the problem. 
Uh, what I mean by that is that people's identity can become defined by a particular problem or a challenge. And any attempt by others to address that problem can sometimes be seen as a challenge to their own identity. And this intrigued me for many years, and I subscribed to the philosophy that uh, you've got to go to know. So I did go a number of times, uh, primarily to visit uh, some family who still live in Nazareth and also to pray in the White Mosque and Masjid al-Abiyad. Uh, that my uh, fifth or sixth uh, great-grandfather, Sheikh Abdullah al-Fahum, built over 200 years ago. Incidentally, Sheikh Abdullah chose white to symbolize uh, a new era of purity and peace to be enjoyed between the Abrahamic faiths in Nazareth. And one of the main personal revelations during my visits was learning about the societal depth of Arab Jews in Israel. And I'm referring to the Mizrahi Jews who originated, as we know, from across the Arab world, even before Islam, including from Syria, Ir Iraq, Morocco, Egypt, Libya, Yemen. Uh, in fact, when Islam spread, uh, Jews under Islamic rule were given the status of Ahl al uh, with full legal protections and uh, freedom of religion, along with other pre-Islamic uh, religious groups, uh, of course. Uh, and they were usually also governed by their own laws that better suited their, their faiths. In Medina, for example, the large Jewish community were even allowed to have their own courts. Today, they make up over a third of the population of Israel. And when you combine that with Palestinian Arabs, make up well over 50% of the population of the whole region. So many of the leading business people in and politicians in Israel are Mizrahi Jews who were born in the countries that I just mentioned, uh, and not surprisingly still embrace their Arabic heritage, including language, music, uh, and food. I, I never really appreciated this before I visited and always, I guess, felt torn between, on the one hand, being keen to know and understand the story of these accomplished individuals and learn about their history, fellow Arabs, really, who were born and grew up alongside our grandparents in the great cities of uh, Arabia. Uh, but on the other hand, of course, the putrid politics, which uh, I always avoided and, and still do. And I remember my uh, late paternal grandfather, Daya uh, Ja'far, who, whose cabinet, when he served as deputy prime minister uh, of Iraq in the 50s, included a number of uh, accomplished Iraqi Jews, who once told me that one of the greatest losses for Iraq in the 20th century was the loss of its Jewish population. Uh, you know, Baghdad at the turn of the 20th century was around a quarter Jewish, way more in number uh, and probably even in percentage terms than Jerusalem uh, at the time. Of course, this doesn't address the politics and as a simple businessman, I'm not qualified to even uh, attempt a discussion uh, on that. Um, yeah, so this is uh, maybe, uh, allow me to, to, to take second part of the question, maybe because you didn't um, discuss the business dimension. So. Can we, I mean, what, what, what about the business dimension of the, this accord? How, how do you see it? On business and in general, not specifically referring to Israel now, uh, I'm a believer in the power of business to help build bridges uh, that can be resilient to all manner of shocks. Uh, look, the world we live in has been built on the power of exchange. Uh, and the theory is that the more interconnected we are through exchange, the more we build mutual dependency. So it forces you to create working solutions to any issues that arise because you now have a vested self-interest in doing so. I can name many examples in history where uh, this has stood the test of time. And where it hasn't, it was perhaps because there was an inequality of dependence where the imbalance of interest eventually led to a breakdown uh, in uh, relationships. Look, at the end of the day, the UAE as a sovereign nation exercised its sovereign right to do what it felt was best on a number of levels. And don't forget, whenever anybody tries to carve a new pathway to anything, the new path by definition is bound to face resistance. And it takes a lot of courage to embark on any new journey. Uh, but I also believe that the universe has a way of rewarding the brave. You know, as the old saying goes, fortune favors the bold. Uh, of course, keep in mind that successful relationships, of course, are ultimately based on trust. And trust isn't something that you build overnight with words or papers. Uh, it's something that both parties to any relationship have to work very hard on, uh, earning uh, 
through uh, actions. Uh, and time will tell whether uh, a relationship was built to last. Thank you for answering my unexpected question uh, better. And uh, I'll leave it now to uh, Karim uh, to start moderating uh, this session. Karim Tabba is uh, a HBR Arabia Advisory Board member. And uh, thank you again, uh, better. And uh, I hope uh, everybody enjoyed the session. To you, Karim. Well, thank you so much, Hamoud. And uh, better, welcome again. Uh, shall we get started with our theme today, with our questions today? Let's do it. Yeah. Well, let's get started by getting your personal intakes on the overall situation with COVID-19 and how you see the path of recovery and uh, how in the coming months or years ahead. The C word. Uh, <laughs> I know, look, we can talk about COVID for hours and still only scratch the surface of the yesterday, today uh, and tomorrow of the pandemic. And the reality is there's still far more that we don't know than what we do know. Uh, but in general, uh, and perhaps starting on a more positive note, the, it's clear that the science is moving very quickly, more quickly than in any other global health crisis in history. You know, every disaster uh, or doomsday movie starts with the government ignoring a scientist. Yeah. Uh, and while there were many skeptics early on uh, in this pandemic, and you'll always have the naysayers, I think we're rapidly developing um, a collective consciousness, if you will, around the risks that the virus poses to us as individuals uh, and society at large, uh, how to minimize the risk of contagion, especially with our most vulnerable, uh, and of course the urgency uh, of developing solutions to counter both the health uh, as well as, of course, the socioeconomic consequences of the pandemic. In terms of outlook, it depends what time horizon you're talking about. I guess let's start with short term to start okay. with. In short term, you know, there's still a host of known unknowns, if you will, uh, that we're grappling with. Uh, vaccine approvals uh, and the time frame for mass deployment, uh, whether reinfection is possible. We've seen some limited evidence of this already. Uh, and if so, then the severity of symptoms with reinfection. Uh, types of, uh, uh, of uh, immune response, types of you know, T-cell theory, the nature of future strains, whether vaccines are likely to be effective against all strains, or whether they'll need constant adaptation every year, like with the, the flu vaccine. But in general, on health, uh, and despite the fact that we still, of course, have worrying numbers of new infections uh, in a number of countries around the world, including uh, in our own region, uh, the fatality rate is not rising. And in many countries, even with ones uh, which are showing a spike in infections, the, fat the fatal fatality rates are, are far lower uh, than, they, than they were before, probably partly because we're doing a lot more testing uh, and not just of the sick, and also because uh, we've learned to treat symptoms more effectively, possibly also because of the younger demographic uh, that uh, are getting the virus. With the economy, um, and while uh, no economy, of course, has been immune to the health crisis uh, and resultant lockdowns, uh, we're, I think we're seeing a bottoming out of the immediate economic fallout uh, in most major economies. The big questions are, of course, uh, about the pace, what the pace of recovery will be. Don't forget, uh, as a result of the fiscal and monetary uh, policies around the world, global debt re reached uh, new records uh, during the first quarter of this year, over 250 trillion dollars, which is well over 300% of global uh, GDP. New corporate debt, of course, uh, companies issued over a trillion dollars uh, on, the, on their books uh, to try and counter, of course, the, the, the effects on business. And you can't just sweep that under the carpet. Uh, there'll be heaps, heaps of debt servicing in the years to come, albeit, of course, at, uh, at least today, record low interest rates. We're also seeing a significant divergence in recovery. Uh, I think both sectorially and different sectors obviously faring far better than others, uh, which is why the S&P 500 is going crazy. Uh, you know, tech represents close to 30% of that index, uh, but only 6% of the US uh, economy or GDP, which is why perhaps you're seeing that kind of divergence or dislocation, uh, but also geographically. Uh, and I think uh, it's sadly very clear that the economic fallout of the pandemic will push many of the world's poorest nations uh, that are already have, you know, struggling with, 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 uh, with their economies into debt distress. But I think overall in the short term, 
Uh, I'd like to think that we've averted um, a global economic meltdown that we can't uh, recover from. Well, thank you, Bader. You've provided us with a comprehensive overview of the pandemic effect at health level, geographical level, macroeconomic level on the short run. Now, on the longer run, especially after you've mentioned some alarming macroeconomic indicators, how do you see things changing? Yes, of course. Look, longer term is where I'm more concerned. Um, yeah. Pandemics have a way of shifting the course of history uh, and not always uh, in a manner that's immediately evident. And some effects might well be accepted as positive shifts when we look back in years to come. But we can't be complacent uh, and spectate. Uh, you know, I'm worried that the structural impact of the virus on the social and socioeconomic landscapes is something that we're not doing enough to properly anticipate proactively uh, and address it. Look, understandably, the majority of intervention, both government and private to date, has been to address the immediate emergency. Uh, but we already know that, uh, according to the World Bank, the pandemic uh, can push up to 100 million people into extreme poverty this year alone. As many as 130 million more people than previously projected can go hungry in 2020. Uh, and structurally, uh, because certain social behaviors may have changed uh, permanently, this might create a seismic shift in certain parts of our economy that we might need to help our society, you know, job seekers uh, and businesses themselves to prepare for with urgency if we're to ensure that our economic engines keep generating jobs and other opportunities for our youth. Can you elaborate a little bit on this, please, if you have any examples in mind that we can learn about it? Yeah, look, I, I'll just say that longer term, I think we have a number of, uh, of unknown unknowns, including, of course, the, the, the uh, you know, potential for new pandemics, uh, you know, and the what, when, who, and why uh, of a new uh, global disease. Uh, so again, preventative measures, long-term planning around this, I think, is something that we mustn't neglect. And I'm not just talking about building economic resilience. Let's not forget that the source of this pandemic was our neglect of nature. And yeah. I think you know, we've already learned, perhaps the hard way, that the protection of nature is not set, not just for ornamental reasons, uh, but that it's fundamental to the health uh, and well-being of, uh, of humanity. Yeah. You've touched on the government's response to the pandemic, and you specifically referred to urgent uh, responses. That's tr triggered me to ask you about how would you rate the response of governments to the uh, pandemic in general at the global level and regional level? Please. Look, we've seen governments around the world handle this very differently. Uh, a whole spectrum of responses from doing very little uh, to strictly enforce curfews and uh, implementation of track and trace. And time will tell who got it right and who didn't. But one thing I do know is that being a policymaker for these past uh, few months was one of the toughest jobs in the world. Because whatever you did, you were wide open to criticism. Look, the trade-offs were and still are very serious, right? Between health and the economy, and even within health, the trade-off between physical health and mental health. How long can you keep people isolated and children away from their schools before you negatively impact uh, people's mental well-being, uh, which in turn might be something that we're left to deal with for many years to come? I won't comment on other countries' responses, but uh, with the UAE, I believe that our policy response was uh, and is admirable. Um, we took action with, uh, I think, what are the kind of three essential uh, areas. One being mass testing, close to 7 million tests to date, one of the highest in the world per capita. The second being uh, regular communication with daily situation br briefings. And of course, proactive uh, engagement in, in identifying novel therapies and even vaccine trials, which you know about. Where I personally believe we now need to measure our successes is not just in the life saves, life save, which is critical, but also in the livelihoods saved. So in essence, jobs and businesses that are rescued. And this is in line with the longer term interventions that I just spoke about. But I'm of course aware of the government's multi-billion dirham uh, government, federal government support scheme to encourage, encourage banks to provide interest-free loans and other federal uh, measures uh, to reduce uh, some costs on business. But I also know of too many good businesses and entrepreneurs who are closing doors because they either weren't able to access those loans or because uh, it wasn't what they uh, needed. Uh, and uh, of course, I get that we're never going to save everyone. 
and that some businesses were not perhaps meant to survive. Uh, but this is the backbone of our economies, right? It, it'll be far more expensive and difficult to recreate a new business landscape than to save uh, the existing one. And on that note, it's not just up to the government to intervene, right? We as established businesses need to really get involved. You know, Crescent Enterprises, uh, for example, partnered with Sharaq and Sharjah to launch a grant fund for the region for this very reason, giving grants to young businesses that were assessed as being fundamentally viable, uh, but fatally compromised uh, because of COVID. I think we all obviously have a role to play in making sure this happens. We can't all wait for someone else to do it, because if we fail, then we'll all suffer big time uh, in the long term. Yeah, you've just said that we've learned a lot from the pandemic. You've specifically mentioned that as a, as a humanity, we learned that protection is important. Would you be able to summarize what we have learned as business and perhaps as governments? What is the, in one intake, what is the most learning, valuable learning that we obtained from the pandemic? You know, I honestly think we're probably still only at the start of that learning journey. Um, and I think we still need to process a lot of what's happened and then identify how we're going to pivot going forward. The reality is, um, I mean, if you ask on the business front, uh, it's, it's being nimble, it's being flexible, it's being able to adapt. Uh, and those are things which we've been told for years are essential in order to deal with the new economy and the knowledge economy. You need to be flexible, you need to be able to, to adapt your business model to the new reality. But the pandemic comes and, and slaps you around the back of the head and suddenly you need to do that within days, not measured in months or years. So adaptability, flexibility in general, but as I said, there's so much that we still need to gauge and learn that will take a bit more time to process. And we'll see in a few years time which businesses were able to adapt and thrive uh, in a changed environment and which perhaps were too rigid uh, and as a result perished. So it's protection and stress test on how adaptable and, for, and uh, flexible and resilient we really were. Let's move on to the energy sector which is uh, an area that perhaps you are one of the very few people who can comment on being from coming from the private oil sector background. Now you've been actively, uh, you've been active in oil and gas sector for ages, for decades, and through Crescent Petroleum and uh, affiliated companies. Can you give us a snapshot of what you see happening with the global energy sector today, especially when we take either, either with the COVID effect and after COVID, COVID effect and your in your vision for the future on that. So yeah, as you said, Crescent Petroleum has been active for five decades now. It uh, started life in 1969. And over the past you know, half century, the oil and gas sector has endured political, economic, and technological revolutions. And on the whole, emerged larger and stronger. However, the current revolution, the environmental revolution, will be especially hard, uh, I think, to navigate. Look, abundant, affordable, and of course, accessible energy, the three A's, if you will, uh, were obviously, was obviously a key driver behind human prosperity and advancement over the past century. Today, we have a new A that we must incorporate, acceptable. Uh, and as we know, uh, it's a political debate as much as it is an economic uh, or scientific one. I think it's worth me putting this in perspective with some numbers, and I spoke about this a few days ago, so I, they're still fresh um, in my mind. Please. Today, our world consumes approximately 290 million barrels of oil equivalent uh, every day. Obviously not all oil, uh, but over 80% of that is, is hydrocarbons, so oil, gas, and coal. Uh, by comparison, solar represents 2% uh, of the energy mix today. And as the world's population grows, and as more people move into the middle class with middle class consumption appetites, energy demand is expected to shoot up to 350 million barrels of oil equivalent per day by 2040, so in 20 years, uh, which is like saying we need another six new Saudi Arabias in equivalent production to satisfy uh, that increased demand uh, by then. And just a side note, you know, I, I think one of the interesting phenomenon uh, that I find is that despite society being so utterly dependent on energy, the majority, uh, including most politicians, have no clue really what they consume uh, in terms of units, uh, at least. You know, I believe this awareness disconnect between the producer and the ultimate consumer of energy is one of the main reasons by the trust deficit uh, that exists uh, between them. The result of which 
uh, in many ways is a growing mismatch uh, between much needed sound energy policy around the world uh, and the warped politics that often ends up uh, governing it. Of course, perhaps not unexpectedly, there's a massive inequality of energy habits uh, and consumption as you go uh, around the world. Uh, the average American uses 60 barrels uh, per year equivalent. Uh, China and India, about five barrels per year per capita. Uh, most of West Africa, less than a barrel uh, per person uh, every year. But the size of the, of the, of the uh, global middle class is expected to increase by one and a half billion people by 2030, so just in 10 years time. And some 90% of that increase is gonna come from Asia. And that'll have huge implications. I mean, just think about it you know, in terms of air transport. 80% of the world's population is yet to fly or be on a plane. Yet last year, more than 5 billion air trips were taken. Uh, of course, the developed and rapidly developing world's insatiable appetite for energy has led to rising uh, GHG emissions, global greenhouse uh, emissions. Which, which is an 80% increase in the last 50 years. And 75% of these emissions is from fossil fuels. So this is not sustainable, but systemic change on a mass scale is not easy. Um, uh, the transition from biomass to coal and then from coal to oil and gas took two centuries and of course is still uh, ongoing. And, and, these and these transitions, you know, the past transitions happen naturally because of an efficiency imperative. This latest one is primarily to counter the effects of these last two transitions on our environment. But with primary energy demand uh, growing at record rates, we urgently need to see the adoption of smarter long-term energy policy and be extremely careful how we face the politics and power plays uh, that could destabilize uh, an orderly transition and even threaten global st stability uh, and, and security. And look, 2020 is not a year to predict long-term trends. Yeah. Um, the COVID pandemic has obviously shaken uh, the world. Um, it's stress tested, I guess, many of the old energy alliances, perhaps even created some new ones, uh, but also revealed many weaknesses in many of the sector's business models. Uh, whether we like it or not, today the world's supply chains will fail without oil and gas. Uh, how to reduce global emissions without crippling the supply chains is the real energy transition challenge. And this is not ideological, uh, and nor should it be polarizing. So I think your, set, your question perhaps satisfied, uh, at least put at ease many people who are in the oil sector who were highly uh, depressed by what happens during May when oil traded at negative. Because what you're saying right now is on, if we forget the short term uh, outcome and talking medium range come for the next 10 years, you see a huge demand or let not say huge demand, increasing demand and the shift towards sustainable energy is important, but still needs time. So fossil oil era is not over. Am I getting you correct? At least for the next 10 years, nobody can predict uh, for further time. Look, as much as the world would be better off, of course, uh, in having um, power supplies and energy supplies that do not emit uh, greenhouse gases, um, uh, it's, it's not feasible today at the scale in which the world consumes energy. Uh, is, that, is that transition likely to, to, to happen in the next 10 years? I personally, I, I don't think you're going to complete the transition in the next 10 years. I think it will take longer. Of course, look, there are always, you know, those uh, black swan events. There are always things that can completely shift the manner in which people consume, also needs and requirements, and also new technologies that could come and blow us all away. And we have to be open to that and prepared for that. But we also need to be, I think, um, smart about how we implement policies which allow us to, on the one hand, live the lives that we're living, but of course with tweaks and changes to consumer behavior, but at, and at the same time allow for the world's uh, developing uh, regions and, and populations and societies to, to catch up, to catch up in terms of prosperity, uh, which of course will mean consumption habits, which will put more burden on, on, on energy requirements in the world. So it just needs longer term thinking, uh, and so less impacted and affected by hand, headlines and, and be a lot more disciplined about really understanding the trend lines. Thank you so much, satisfied. Now, uh, let's talk now about sustainable energy. Now, having talked about fossil oil, how the future would look like and what role oil and gas companies can play in that shift? 
So on the issue of uh, oil and gas companies, I guess, you know, I, I'm not going to make any predictions on prices. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll stay away from, uh, you know, they, they say the only function of oil price forecasting is to make astrology look respectable. Uh, but if I had to make a prediction, it's, it's that oil and gas companies, I think, will focus increasingly heavy, heavily on ESG, which, as you know, is environmental, social and corporate governance metrics in the years to come. Uh, publicly listed and private companies uh, alike are feeling increasingly vulnerable uh, in the face of shareholder but also stakeholder expectations around these metrics and everyone will be uh, jumping on this uh, bandwagon and i very much hope that that to a large extent that will help the structure to become more resilient and perhaps acceptable which is as i said the fourth uh, uh, a but it has to be done authentically just publishing reports and giving green speeches with lofty targets isn't going to cut it uh, many will need to dig deep into structural reforms around their business models and demonstrate that uh, we're able to adapt to a new world, making sure that our businesses are not just environmentally sustainable, but also economically viable. Otherwise, we'll just create a new breed of huge zombie energy businesses uh, plaguing uh, our economic uh, landscape, causing a whole host of other problems. And look, on the ESG subject, I just want to say something more about this from an investor uh, point of view, because it's such a hot topic. Um, just like traditional investing, there are many different strategies you can deploy to be an ESG investor. You can pick uh, low carbon companies, companies with uh, more women on their boards, businesses that promote um, uh, best working uh, workplace practices. But is that really the best way to get to a more sustainable future? You know, I think Investing to match your values is actually pretty different to methodically picking out the companies that are best able to survive in a sustainable future. And the key is to ask what societal shifts are likely to happen that will impact a particular sector. And then with a particular company, uh, has that company embraced a business model that will benefit from that transition? And whether its leaders are long-term thinkers with with the credibility and also partnerships uh, to make that happen. Uh, in other words, it's less about what a glossy report says now uh, and more about uh, a deeper assessment of, of how um, uh, the business is likely to fare uh, later. Anyway, that's just some related uh, food for thought. Well, you've talked about increasing consumption level. You've talked about increasing social, uh, changing social habits. Now I'm thinking as changes as a human being. And I remember you man, uh, comment, making a comment about the changing uh, eating habits. How would these change, societal changes, con changes consumer behavior would make, would change us perhaps at a personal level in eating? And eating habits is an interesting one. You know, the world today eats well over 50 billion animals and 150 million tons of seafood every year which uh, again accounts for for about 15 percent of uh, of ghg emissions will a shift away from consuming meat reduce this uh, i guess it depends uh, what they replace it with and, and uh, whether growing whatever they replace it with creates damage elsewhere so that's i guess yet, yet to be seen but it's certainly interesting uh, to observe uh, that phenomenon in the coming years but just on you know what other things need to need to really happen right for us to really see um, a sustainable future become a reality um, and i think what's what's essential so i guess i'll refer to a couple of uh, or a number of things uh, that i think we need to see happening in parallel and it really is a, a multi-stakeholder effort first uh, and i've written about this a lot and that's the acceleration of the coal to gas and also oil and also oil to gas switch you know, coal, coal, uh, sorry, coal to, to gas switches can, can achieve amazing results. You know, UK did it and their GHG emissions are back to 18, 90 levels. Germany didn't and its em emissions have barely fallen. Uh, for this to happen, of course, China and India uh, need to uh, play ball. But to put into perspective what the opportunity is here, uh, natural gas substituting for coal-fired electricity in the past five years alone reduced global CO2 emissions by 100 times more than all the electric cars uh, in the world. Uh, and that's equivalent to half of all the world's cars converting to clean electric energy overnight. So a massive uh, opportunity. Case in point are opportunities in the Kurdistan region of Iraq, uh, which since um, 2008, 2009, 
uh, replaced uh, liquid fuel power generation with uh, natural gas uh, doesn't only save uh, the government over $20 billion in fuel subsidies, but also uh, generated savings uh, in, in well over 30 million tons of CO2, which would have otherwise been emitted. That's, of course, in addition to the tens of thousands of jobs that were created and, and uh, local industries that uh, it spurred. Uh, second, and of course, uh, very important, uh, which is the rollout of uh, locally fit for purpose renewables. Uh, this can't be a one size fits all approach. Uh, load factors, uh, which are highly dependent on uh, local weather and climate conditions, affect, of course, the cost competitiveness and the carbon intensity of renewable technology. Uh, Northwest Europe, for example, is not uh, suited to solar power like some parts of the Middle East, uh, but it has some, some of the best conditions for offshore wind. Okay. And where intermittency is a problem, which it often is, uh, then pairing renewable technology with gas uh, creates uh, uh, robust energy systems, I think. So uh, third, which I think is important to, to, uh, to mention, is really a stronger push to uh, embrace greater energy efficiency through uh, greater energy tech or better adoption of energy tech, but also encouraging better consumer behavior. You know, there's so much we can do uh, to, to consume uh, better. I was just talking about this someone earlier today, just adjusting our thermostat at home uh, from uh, during the summer period from 20 from 23 from 20 degrees to 23 degrees can save 30 percent uh, consumption but also being realistic about what practices really make a difference for example uh, i'm all up for getting rid of plastic straws uh, but all the plastic straws in the world add up to about 2,000 tons of uh, the nearly 100 million tons of plastic waste that hits our waters yearly with less than 0.002 percent uh, of uh, plastic waste. So we can't just feel our doing our part by drinking out of a paper straw. We have to be informed by data and science uh, and really tackle the root problems. Uh, you know, it was heartwarming to see, I think, one of the, uh, some of the images around the uh, cleaner cities during lockdown. And I think some people say more flexible working practices and working from home because of COVID uh, will reduce uh, emissions. But the reality is don't forget our homes are generally speaking less uh, efficient uh, less energy efficient uh, than our offices. So perhaps the extra that we burn at home may wipe out what we save uh, in, the, in the office uh, commute. And of course, people staying away from public transport uh, could also mean more cars on the road. Uh, so I think it's too early to tell um, uh, what the long-term effects of the pandemic will have uh, when it reaches steady state. Uh, a big one, the last one I'll mention on this point, because I don't think it's talked about enough, uh, is reforestation and of course bi biodiversity protection. You know, deforestation today uh, accounts for about 15 to 20 percent of uh, GHG emissions, but it's also critical carbon sinks uh, and storage. You know, they absorb around 30 percent of all human CO2 uh, emissions. And since 1990, we've been losing forest area the size of the UAE every single year. Uh, you know, and some of the West's policies have actually been counterproductive by creating financial incentives for South America and Asia to accelerate deforestation, to grow and sell biofuels for Western consumption, uh, enabling the West to meet its own targets by increasing net global emissions. Uh, so, you know, go, go, go figure, as they say. And of course, my wife will be very cross with me if I don't mention this, but uh, reducing uh, deforestation also protects endangered wildlife uh, and biodiversity, and of course, indigenous uh, people. Uh, you know, one million species of plants and animals today are currently at risk of extinction. The main cause of which, of course, is uh, disruption of natural habitats. Uh, so that's that's I think essential to uh, to really focus on, and it's just not talked about enough when you hear when you hear discourse about how we're going to to uh, really embrace a more environmentally friendly world. Thank you for highlighting this point. It's uh, for sure very important. And I have received any good questions from the audience about hydrogen. Is there a bright future for that technology? What do you think? Yeah. A lot of media attention has turned uh, to hydrogen as the eventual successor of natural gas, uh, an alternative energy storage solution for renewables. Look, the two primary technologies to produce low carbon hydrogen, uh, blue hydrogen from uh, natural gas with carbon capture and storage, uh, and then green, uh, which is from water via electrolysis, uh, via renew renewable power. Uh, they're both expensive today. And while the scope, there is scope to reduce, of course, costs in the future, I think the true potential remains uh, uncertain. Uh, the cost, of course, of transporting hydrogen is likely to remain quite high uh, 
I think due to its uh, physical uh, properties and characteristics. So while we can see the potential for low carbon hydrogen, I think to, to play a role in decarbonizing certain uh, carbon intensive uh, heavy industries like uh, ammonia, urea, steel production, some of the current, I think, hype, if you will, around hydrogen may be overstated, but, but let's see. To be honest, I'm more excited about um, new technologies like hybrid nuclear power, okay. which is uh, a means of, uh, a, a of generating power by a combination of fusion and fission processes. The basic idea is to use neutrons from a fusion reaction to trigger uh, fission in non-fissile uh, fuels. Uh, and the reactions are subcritical, so in theory, safe, um, uh, but that's for another thing. Well, uh, we've ended up talking a lot about energy, which is an important topic, but let's uh, talk a bit about other issues because you're active in a number of other sectors through Crescent Enter Enterprises, this including ports and logistics, power, healthcare, venture capital. For you as a diversified business group, what does smart diversification look like? Look, diversification is essential in building economic resilience, especially in the face of turbulence uh, and volatility. Uh, I think that's widely accepted. Um, and if you choose to keep all your eggs in a single basket, then you better watch that basket super closely because if it drops, then you're in uh, deep trouble. Um, specialization and standardization were products of the industrial age and served its purpose. However, I think in you know today in the information age, and as we embrace the knowledge economy, the importance of gaining an appreciation for seemingly disconnected disciplines uh, it's crucial, I think, for our economies and businesses. You know, most traditional business models were linear in nature. Today, I think most successful businesses are nonlinear. Uh, why? Simply because the nature, you know, and human nature follows nonlinear systems. So your entrepreneurial mind uh, is nonlinear, and that's why you're able to innovate and generate ideas that can that, that, that can disrupt uh, existing industries. You know, so make your business model nonlinear, so that when conditions and environment change, you can shift. Uh, your business in the direction of, uh, of that momentum. Now, I'm not saying that uh, developing certain skills or specializing in specific sectors are wrong. Of course not. Uh, but I, I like to encourage uh, what is called a specialized diversification, uh, where, whereby you are usually able to find specific synergies between seemingly unconnected businesses to create a, a group which is much stronger than the sum of its parts. And that's what we've strived to do uh, with the Crescent Group. Uh, you know, personally, I've always thrived on diversity in my work. You know, I can't imagine waking up doing the exact same thing every, every single day. Uh, so it may sound like an oxymoron, but uh, I, I sort of sometimes have to mix up things in order to stay uh, focused. Um, and I did this with business when I, when I launched, businesses that I launched when I left university, from e-commerce platforms to fashion accessories business, businesses, which uh, many of which failed, but one of which succeeded, which gave me my first taste of, uh, of success when I sold it uh, at, a, at a healthy return. And over history, uh, the most successful societies have been ones where different disciplines were embraced as being interconnected. You know, the so-called Islamic golden age um, during the uh, Abbasiyah, uh, whose uh, capital was, of course, Baghdad, uh, fl flourished not just because of Islamic scholars, uh, but because of a, a juxtaposition of the arts and sciences uh, drawn from India and China, Greeks, uh, Persia, you know, scholars who came together and embraced uh, diversity and, and diversification. And I'd like to emphasize the arts here because I think all deep innovation happens at the intersection of science with the humanities. And this is something I think we lost in the dark ages of uh, Islamic civilization that followed uh, the golden uh, age. And the same phenomenon uh, with, the, with the Renaissance period in, in Europe between the 14th and 17th century, where scientific discovery and a cultural revolution ha uh, happened hand in hand. So back to business, this is what I've tried to create with uh, Crescent Enterprises or CE, uh, which is the other subsidiary of the Crescent Group, uh, the other one being Crescent uh, Petroleum. And CE itself, uh, evolved over the years, uh, but over a few years, uh, uh, over a few years ago, I restructured it in, into a four distinct uh, but connected platforms. Uh, together now, uh, employs over 5,000 people, represents over 40 companies of investments uh, and, and operating businesses, and the platforms all have names that describe what they actually do. There's uh, CE Operates, uh, 
which covers all our operating businesses, uh, including Gulftainer, which is today the largest privately owned port operator in the world. Uh, CE Invests, which is our uh, strategic late stage investment platform that invests predominantly in private equity and other structured investments. CE Ventures, uh, our corporate venture capital arm, uh, through which uh, we have uh, capitalized uh, with, with $150 million for investment in, uh, in, in high impact uh, startups in the Middle East and internationally. In fact, we just allocated an additional $30 million uh, to it uh, towards biotech uh, and deep tech uh, investments to be deployed within the next six months. And finally, CE Creates, which is our internal business incubator, which really I established to continue, I guess, the legacy of entrepreneurship uh, within the family business, coupling business incubation with inclusive uh, social impact. So I guess it covers the life cycle of business activities from startups to larger mature businesses and across numerous sectors, which are more uh, strategically selected. But on the point uh, on about social impact, I'd just like to say something about this because there's a lot of noise, I guess, that can be confusing to many. And you know, I've been advocating and talking about social entrepreneurship for 15 years or so now, um, ever since I met, in fact, uh, and talked to Bill Drayton, who founded okay. Ashoka, uh, and he coined the term uh, social uh, entrepreneurship. And it's also why over the years I've engaged with and worked with uh, here in the region, most of the global organizations who espouse those principles, including Endeavor, uh, Synergos, Acumen, uh, and of course, Ashoka uh, itself. Look, in a nutshell, I believe there's a renewed social contract between business and society. So I guess like an awakening to a larger, a larger perspective uh, and, a, and a view of the role companies play in the world. And it's not just because of societal expectations. The reality is, whether some like it or not, our global challenges will not be solved if we don't have business on board and on the front lines of creating solutions and being held accountable for creating measurable impact. Uh, towards addressing these uh, challenges. And there's no doubt in my mind that we're increasingly seeing companies embracing the belief that a socially centered purpose is ultimately uh, a competitive advantage in today's uh, rapidly shifting societies. Uh, and that such a purpose is highly compatible with profitable growth, i.e. it's not a zero sum game, which is why we're seeing more and more CEOs uh, pivoting, I think, to embrace real inclusive, responsible, and lasting growth. And this principle is firmly embedded uh, into every business model within all CE's uh, in investments and, and operating businesses that we create. Well, there's so much more to get onto and we haven't even uh, touched on important topics such as philanthropy and education. And I'm sure we also need to get more focus on region socioeconomic landscape and more views or uh, more focus on entrepreneurship. You've highlighted now quickly about it, but we would love to hear more in more details. So perhaps this is a good point to end the first session and we look uh, forward to part two in a few weeks time. And it was a pleasure having you, Badr, uh, very important uh, insights and thoughts you left us with. And also thank you all once again for joining us. And for sure, we'll be sending you through in the invite uh, about the second session soon. Thank you, everyone, and have a good day. Pleasure and honor is mine, Fiamman. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.